a popular survey of the Old Testament lecture number one um, by Professor Dana Reeves. That is me. That is I. Um, grace and peace to you all. I pray that you all are having a blessed and wonderful week. Let's get started. So first of all, I just want to apologize if you guys hear any background noise. I'm actually sitting outside, so I'm hoping there won't be too much traffic noise, but um, this lecture will cover the following. Christ, the, the, the key to inspiration and canonization of the Bible. Christ, the key to interpretation of the Bible. So it's going to cover the introduction of our book. Christ, the key to inspiration and canonization. Common questions asked about the Bible. What, does, what is the Bible all about? How can I understand its meaning? Why are there 66 books in the Bible? And um, how do I know it's the word of God? These are the key questions that we get all the time, um, especially in ministry. But sometimes we don't really have a solid answer. So this lecture is going to go through and actually give you some of the solid answers um, from a theological perspective. Jesus Christ is the key to both the inspiration and the interpretation of the Bible. Jesus Christ confirmed the collection of um, books as both complete and authoritative. That's it. The Bible is complete. What is canonization? Canonization describes the process by which the community of God's people accept certain scriptures as divinely inspired and authoritative. The need of canonization for scripture. So there's a need for canonization. It just doesn't come out of anywhere, right? So it's the rule or the norm in the reverse of sacred writings, that which are the rule or the norm for faith and practice among believers. So um, in the early church, other books were floating around. Um, and these are the books a lot of times um, you hear people say that this is not the real Bible. There's hidden books of the Bible. Um, but it was just like it caused controversy now. It caused controversy then. Where community of, of believers were coming together saying, no, we should be studying this. We should say this person's a prophet. This person is not a prophet. So the church fathers took the um, opportunity to actually come along and say that um, this is what we should be working on. This is our foundation. So in an attempt to develop unity among Christians, some of the authorities in the early church gathered together to decide which book should be included in the Bible and which ones should not. Christ and the inspiration of the Bible. The New Testament is a historically accurate document. One of the um, issues is that sometimes people will talk about the Bible and they'll say, well, it's all made up. It's all a bunch of big fairy tales. But what they ignore is the fact that there's evidence of the life of Jesus outside the New Testament. Jesus existed. Period. There's a historical Jesus that existed. There's no question about it because there's so many um, texts and so many um, script, scriptures outside of the Bible where you can find evidence that Jesus exists. Um, so our book goes through a lot of um, evidence for you all to look at. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them for the sake of time. But I did find this one thing that I highlighted that I thought was pretty interesting. It said that um, the text over 5,000 manuscript copies of New Testament copied with over 99% accuracy. That's less than 1% affected no significant teaching, which means that a lot of ancient texts were copied over and over and over. But the Bible is one that stood the test of time. So I thought that was pretty interesting um, when people go to start comparing our Bible to other ancient scripts that, you know, it was copied, but it had accuracy in its copy, like in its um, translations. What Jesus taught about the inspiration of the Bible. So uh, when Jesus was teaching the disciples, he confirmed that the Old Testament is, is the divinely authoritative word of God. And he promised that the Holy Spirit would lead his disciples in writing an inspired New Testament. And that's found on page 13. So where does the Apocrypha fit into this? The Apocrypha is 11 books added by the Roman Catholic Church at the Council of Trent. So you know they were all kind of um, 
gatherings and the council was just church fathers basically and church leaders getting together and say determining what is christianity and hammering out what is it that we are doing believing and how are we going to live out our community of faith the word apocalypse comes from the greek word meaning hidden or secret so we know that the catholic church um believed that the bible was not meant for the common man this is one of the reasons why um the protestant church sprang out of the catholic church you know they just did not believe that um you know that that the common man should be handling the Bible. That it was so sacred that only the priests could handle it, and not you know men and women of God could handle it. Um, I'm not gonna get into all of that. All right, the simple answer is it doesn't. Jesus never quoted or approved or accepted the apocrypha. The Jews never accepted the apocrypha book as scripture. And you gotta remember that Jesus is what a Jew. So let's remember that. Important, yes, but not God's word. So um, you'll find the different versions of the Bible, different streams of, um, I'm not going to say denominations, but of Christianity teach different things about the Apocrypha. But uh, for the most part, people say that it's important. It's important. And it's going to be used to enhance um, your Christian walk. It will be enhanced through stories. But many believe that it is not the word of God. Apocra never claimed to be scripture. You know, um, Apocra is never quoted in other authoritative scriptures. Why is Apocra removed from the Bible? Well, there's um, some things that we have to have that, that make the word of God authoritative, right? So it's kind of like a litmus test. It, it makes sure that things add up like two plus two always has to equal four. It's just basic principles. So, scripture must be authoritative. God says, um, scripture must be prophetic. A man of God wrote it. So, it can't be something that just somebody off the street wrote it. The man of God wrote it. And we can authenticate it, right? It has to be authentic, consistent with the rest of the word. It cannot be something that, that skews off to the left or right. It does not match what the word of God has clearly already been, um, already said. Dynamic demonstrates God's life-changing power, uh, received and accepted and used by many other believers. Um, so another issue is it has to be practiced throughout uh, the body of Christ. It has to be, it can't be this random new teaching that's, you know, no one practices except this little region of people. Nobody but God. So the Canonical Councils, Old Testament Hebrew authors and scholars realized, uh, recognized a book that had been written by God by Christ's day. It had been pretty much where ironed out. So in other words, it, it wasn't floating around in the air. They weren't trying to figure it all out. By the time um, Christ came along, we pretty much had the Hebrew authors, pretty much had and scholars recognize that a book had been written by God. So there are some foundations there that had already been established before Christ. So some principles that are already kind of set in stone. In the New Testament, the apostles, the apostles were a large source uh, for the canon, right? They recognized each other's writings as being from Christ as a living eyewitness. So who else will know him better and know his voice and know what the voice of God sounds like except the eyewitness? So we have to take into account the eyewitness part of that. The Apocalypse books endorse doctrine incompatible with the message of the Bible. So, you know, some examples, and there's so much more than this, but um, giving money for the atonements of sins. So I can pay a certain amount of money that would cover me, right? And we all know who died on the cross for our sins. It's Jesus. So no amount of money can pay. I can't pay my way into heaven. Um, praying for the dead and giving money to atone for the sins. Um praying to saints in heaven and asking them for prayer. So we already know that you can't pray to a, another being. We only pray to God. We only pray to uh, Jesus, you know, to advocate in our behalf. We only pray that the Holy Spirit fills us and guides us um, along the way. So when you get into praying to saints and praying to dead people, um, it's kind of contrary to what we teach in Christianity.
What is the correct way to interpret the Bible? The answer is Christ is our God. He is the key to interpretation of the Bible. Jesus claimed five times that he is a theme of the entire Old Testament. And we have scripture evidence for that. The Bible must be interpreted um, Christ centrally, right? So Christ has to be in the center of it. And no one else can be in the center of it. All right, in conclusion, there are three ways in which we can see Christ in the Bible. One, Christ is the theme of both the Old and the New Testament, right? So Christ was anticipated in the Old Testament. The um, Christ, he was realized, and salvation prepared the way for New Testament. Salvation provided by Christ in the Old Testament. Um, prophecies foretold that Christ in the New Testament fulfilled by Christ in the promises of salvation in the Old Testament are brought into completion in the presence of Christ in the New Testament. And that's found in Matthew 1 and 21. Number two um, way in which we can see Christ in the Bible, Christ is the, uh, is the theme of each of the eight sections of the Bible. So that's all listed out in our reading. Um, so you have the law, you have the history, and that's from Joshua to Esther, poetry, part of it. And that's um, from Job to the Song of Solomon, prophecy, Isaiah, Malachi, um, the Gospels, Matthew, John, um, through John, and then the Acts. And that's, once again, a, it's more of a historical um, kind of uh, perspective from a histor historical perspective and the epistles. Uh, and then you end it all with Revelation. And once again, that's back to prophecy. Um, and then... It, sh it should say number three on here, but it says number one. Y'all yeah, pray for my typo. Um, Christ is found in each of the 66 books of the Bible. So you can find, um, in conclusion, you can find Christ throughout the entire Bible. Right? You can find evidence of Christ throughout the entire Bible. So, a conclusion of this lecture, I want you all to comment below. Um, let's get some conversation going about what your perspective is about um the three ways that we can see uh, Christ in the Bible.